Hello and welcome to Senior Solutions, where we bring you topics affecting seniors and their families. And I'm your host, Mindy Fellenton. I'm sure some of you have loved ones or friends who have dealt with cancer and are going or maybe going through that journey now and you're not sure where to turn for help and support. Well, my guest today is Paula Rothenberg with Hope Connections for Cancer Support. And welcome, Paula. Thank you for being here today. It's good to be here. Thank you. And I know that you're going to talk with us a little bit about what Hope Connections does and the programs that they offer to help people who either are going through the, this journey or have a loved one or friends who are going through the journey. I know I do myself right now have a mm -hmm. dear friend who's um, suffering with multiple myeloma. And uh, I know that you have lots of programs that we're going to hear about that can help how to talk to someone, how to deal with people who are aging, treatment when someone's older in life dealing with cancer. Mm -hmm. So I thank you again for being here to talk with us about it. Tell me a little bit about what was the impetus for starting Hope Connections? Well, I never thought I'd be here actually, um, but I lost my dad to cancer in 2004. And shortly after I returned from his funeral, a colleague who ran Make-A-Wish Foundation at the time said, Paula, do you know anybody who'd like to start a cancer support organization? There's a local family who has a little bit of seed money they would like to put towards this and get the ball rolling. So I met with Bernie and Bonnie Kogod, who lost their daughter 20 years earlier to lymphoma. Mm -hmm. And we just clicked immediately. And I ran my own business at the time. It took me about six months to close up shop, but I pulled in my shingle. and. We pulled together like-minded people and started to raise the funds, and it took us about two years to raise the money to open, and we opened in 2007. And what is the mission? We, I'm going to tell you what we don't do, and then I'll tell you what the mission is. Perfect. We don't do medicine. We don't do research. We don't do advocacy. What we do is take care of people living with cancer today that are scared, they don't know how to. They don't know how to go on through this journey. Mm -hmm. um, so we provide free programs of emotional support, education, wellness, and most importantly, hope for people with cancer and for their loved ones. Talk about, um, if you would, the different. I, I got the broad range of mm -hmm. the programs, but could you talk a little bit more in detail about the specifics of some of the programs, so we, we have a better, clearer understanding of the variety of programs that you get. And I, by the way, I'm on your mailing list and I'm always okay. enamored and, and overjoyed to see the various different topics you have. So this will be good for people to be, get more information with greater detail about the wonderful programs that you do have. Great. Thank you. We have five core programs we do. And there's a lot of variation within those programs. But the first and kind of the heart of what we do are support groups. So we have weekly support groups for people with all types of cancer, and we offer two of those, one in the daytime, one in the evening. We do the same for caregivers, so they meet separately from their loved one so that they can cope with you know, the heavy load that is placed upon caregivers, and I know you've done many programs on caregiving. Um, we have a weekly advanced cancer group for people whose cancer has metastasized, mm -hmm. and a young adults with cancer group, and a bereavement group. Then we also have monthly cancer-specific groups, a lung group, ovarian, gynecological, etc. The second core pro program is education. We do a series of educational workshops. We do at least three a month. They range from cancer-specific topics to how do you deal with side effects to how do you cope with the cost of all of this. Mm -hmm. And you've come and done a wonderful program for us, well, so we you. really appreciate My pleasure. The third is mind-body programs. And those are designed to both reduce the stress in people's life, but also to help them rebuild their core strength. Because as you probably know from friends that you've dealt with, you really are, you know, the impact of the disease on someone physically is pretty dramatic. Mm -hmm. um, the fourth is resources and referrals. Um, if somebody needs something, we're going to figure out how to get them the help that they need. And they get that not only from us, but from the peer groups, from just being part of a community of people who are all dealing with the same thing. Mm -hmm. And the final, and this, is, this sets us a little bit apart, um, are programs of what we call social connection. You know, you know as the life of a senior frequently shrinks. Yes. And if you're sick, it shrinks even more. 
So I got a wonderful email from one of our, our um, participants in the advanced cancer group who said, you know, I came in expecting to get some education and some information about what I was dealing with. He said, what I have found instead is that my world has broadened. Mm -hmm. And I now have a network of people who have become incredibly close to me, and I call now some of my best friends. How wonderful. Wow. That's got to make your heart just feel It so. really does. Every, every day we, we hear stories uh, about those kinds of connections. And that's one of the things we love about our name. Yes. Um, <laughs> because connections are so important and the hope piece is so important. Yeah. Well, that's the full circle of really life is yeah. having those connections with people. I mean, that's the essence of it. Exactly. Not to be too philosophical, but it's the reality. It is. Absolutely. And I think what I... I kind of hear in the community is that people are not getting the resources that they need in many different regards. So the fact that you, your organization, offer those resources to people is huge. Well, it's, an o it's overwhelming to hear that you have cancer. And so the first thing people frequently do is go online. There is so much, and so much of it's bad information, that people get even more scared. So most people, the first time they come to us, that I would say is the overriding thing. They are scared. Yeah. Well, it's understandable. Mm -hmm. Yes, it, it is amazing how when you read something on the internet, I know recently I just went through a, it's a, a trivial in relationship to what we're talking about, but my dog, one of them, was diagnosed with MRSA in her lungs. Oh. Well, I went online, of course, and I was reading about it, and mm -hmm. I thought for sure this was it. You know, she was not going to survive. Well, she's, we're six, eight months away from that diagnosis. That's and, good. And here That's she right. is. And it's, strong. you know, our support groups are really designed as peer support groups. They're all facilitated by a licensed clinician. But it's all about the learning in the group. People are living it and going through it and say, oh, I had that. This is what I did. So there's learning that happens in the, in our world every single day mm -hmm. and incredible sharing nice and do you also have doctors who come in and talk about treatment i know you don't specifically guide people med on the medical component but do you also have that as part of these different that's a big part of what we do that's part that's kind of the heart of our education programs in addition to our regular working board we have a medical advisory board that is representative of almost every, well, of all the oncology hospitals in our region. And their task is to represent us in their own institutions, to make sure their colleagues know about us, that they refer their patients to us, and that they get us the best possible speakers for our educational workshops. So our education programs, as I said, range from, you know, a cancer-specific topic. Just two weeks ago, we did one on the mutated BRCA gene, who's at risk, who should be aware of that? Who's looking for it? We do updates every time there's a big, the big breast cancer conference that happens in November every year. In January, we bring in a doc who does an update, who provides, shares all of that information with our people. We also bring in people to deal with specific side effects, um, whether it be neuropathy or lymphedema mm -hmm. or fatigue. So we bring in experts who can talk about that and give our people tips on how they can manage some of those side effects. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. And what about holistic uh, bent? Is there that component of the education programs also? Um, we do. We, we have brought in aromatherapists. Um, we have brought in complementary therapy, a panel of people to talk about complementary therapies. Um, most of that comes through, though, our mind-body programs mm -hmm. because it's, there's a real connection between you know, meditation and yoga and Pilates and those things that are more Eastern medicine um, that really have been much more widely accepted in the States now. And there's a direct connection between wellness and utilizing some of those um, therapies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's wonderful that finally... Many years later. Yeah. Well, we have <laughs> one gentleman who's been coming to us now for about five years. Pancreatic cancer. Um, he lost 74 pounds when he had his surgery. And he totally credits yoga with helping him to rebuild his core strength and give him his life back. Wow. 
He couldn't stand up for more than two or three minutes at a time. Now you would never know it. What a great testimonial. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> I think it's a good lesson to be learned for those of us who are not even dealing with those illnesses mm -hmm. to keep in mind, too. That, correct. And what are some of the specific challenges you see to seniors who are going through this journey? Well, as I mentioned, certainly the shrinking of one's world is a huge issue. Recovery takes a lot longer. And some things you're never going to recover from. You know, if you've got neuropathy and already you have a problem walking or needing a cane and you've got neuropathy in your feet, which is... I was going to say, could you define yes, that for um, some people who may not Well, there are, two, there are actually a couple of different types of neuropathy. There's neuropathy where it deadens um, your extremities. So you, you can't feel in your fingertips. You can't necessarily feel the bottom of your feet. So mm -hmm. taking a step can be a huge challenge. The other type is shooting pains. So they may shoot up your arm, they may shoot up your leg. Um, but for seniors, the biggest problem is the neuropathy where it deadens um, your feeling because you may already have ambulatory issues and you have something that is so difficult to deal with because you can't drive if you've got that type of neuropathy because you can't feel the gas pedals. Um, mm -hmm. If you use a right. cane or a walker, it's, it's, a, it's a real challenge. Um, nutrition is frequently a challenge because a lot of older people, their diets become really restricted. They lose their taste. So when you don't feel like eating, you don't eat. Well, when you're in treatment, you have to eat because you've got to keep up your strength. You've mm -hmm. got to keep your body prepared to fight the disease. So that's one of the things that we find is a problem. Mm -hmm. So I guess that's when they're recommending using some of these products like Ensure. Correct, and we, we always have those around our space. We get donations of it, and we say, take help yourself, and make this available to you. Some of the other challenges that we deal with um, with our senior population are um, preconceived notions of what words mean. Palliative care being one, hospice being another. You know, when you hear, when, when you hear palliative care, Many older people think that means I'm going to die. Mm -hmm. They will only get, what palliative care really is, is you could start getting palliative care from the moment you're diagnosed. It helps you manage your symptoms. Why be in pain? It has nothing to do with end of life. Mm -hmm. It has to do with management of symptoms. But that's a semantic issue. So in fact, we had a palliative care um, program a couple of weeks ago. And we called it that. It was you know, palliative care. We had three or four people sign up. We said, this makes no sense. Everybody needs this. So we changed the title of it on the flyer and just said, symptom management throughout your cancer treatment and beyond. How many we did had you a get? packed house. We had 40 <laughs> people in the room. It yes. was just amazing. <laughs> so words, mean, words are important, yes. especially if you already have an idea of what that word means. Right. And of course, that. I understand where that mindset comes mm -hmm. from. And some of the other issues with seniors is, you know, you reach a certain age, and it's like, do I really need any more treatment? Just stop already. Just let me, you know, be comfortable for my last months or year or whatever of life. And we hear that a lot, and we honor that. Frequently, the pushback comes from the family. Mm -hmm. Isn't there something else that can be done? even if their parent or their loved one doesn't want it anymore. Well, we're going to take a short break, but when we come back, I'd kind of like to follow up a little bit more on that conversation about the family member dealing with the older parent dealing with cancer, because mm -hmm. I think that that's probably something that um, happens quite frequently. It does. So when we come back from our break, we'll take, we'll talk about that again. Okay. So we're going to take a short break right now, and we will be right back. Live with a human for a while, and you get to know a few things. Like, I know she's actually not a morning person. I know she does strange tricks for no treats. I know that water makes her howl like crazy. I even know how the floor stays so clean. She's quick. But the one thing I will never for the life of me know is how she gets so tiny and inside that box. Natalie, how do you get so tiny? Welcome back to Senior Solutions, where we bring you topics affecting seniors and their families. I'm your host, Mindy Fellinton, and I'm joined today by Paula Rothenberg, who is the president 
of Hope Connections for Cancer Support. Welcome back, Paula. Thank you. And where we left off before the break, we were talking about the family members sometimes being involved and perhaps with their older parent, and perhaps they're the ones who are the kind of pushback with the parent wanting to just go with it. Do you offer support groups specifically for the children of a, a parent dealing with that also? We offer support groups for caregivers and for the people with all types of cancer. Caregivers to us are any loved ones. They're not the professional caregivers. They're the parent, the sister, the brother, the adult children. So anyone who wants to in, in that environment, who cares enough about that person, can come and be a, come to our group. And actually, they don't, their parent or sibling or loved one doesn't have to even be coming themselves. Because mm -hmm. some people, you know, your loved one may be in Atlanta, and you're like, oh, my God, I need help. Mm -hmm. so, so they come to us, and we have a very robust caregiver program. Because as I frequently tell people, when you're diagnosed with a disease, whether it's cancer or anything else, you are given by your medical team basically a treatment plan. You know, you know, I got to do this chemo. I need to do this radiation. I have this surgery. You're a caregiver. You get nothing. You are shooting from the hip the entire time. So we have caregivers who are resistant to the fact that a loved one may be dying when it's very evident. Um, we have others that are very supportive of a, a loved one who is resisting dying themselves. Which so it, it happens on both sides. But certainly with our aging population, more frequently, the, the, the elderly cancer patient is more willing to let go than sometimes the families are willing to let them go. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of things that play into that decision making. Most of it's quality of life. Mm -hmm. You know, you could, you could do another treatment, another round of chemo, and be sicker than a dog mm -hmm. for the last three months of your life. And what does, where does that get you? Right. So it's, it's helping people realize that wouldn't you rather spend quality time with your loved one for whatever time they have left, knowing that they are having a good life mm -hmm. before they die. So that's one of the issues. The other is treatment costs. Treatment costs are outrageous. One of our colon cancer docs was in talking about a relatively new drug that he said could maybe prolong somebody's life by three months at a cost of over $100,000. Oh, my gosh. So now you as, you know, a parent who loves your kids, going, I'm going to take this treatment for three months, be sick as a dog, and basically leave nothing left for my, my kids. kids. Mm -hmm. So that's, that plays into the decision making. It's great that there's, again, this sounding board and an opportunity to, to talk with other people who are going through that journey just to say, what did you do? Or what were you right. thinking? But, yeah, there's probably so many, like you said, moving parts to this whole process. There so. are. And we have, you know, luckily we have some um, really wonderful therapists who really help to guide people um, and to, to have them actively talk about what's on their minds, to have other people lis actively listening, and sometimes just getting it on the table helps you make a decision, mm -hmm. where if you're just carrying it around in your mind, it's really, really hard to do that all yeah. by yourself. A sounding board. Mm -hmm. And then just getting it off your mind, too, is sometimes a relief. I know. Mm -hmm. I used to work with a coach for um, business, and he said, just if there's something on your mind, just write it down. Because then it's out of your mind because right. you've written it down. Yeah. And it's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it works. Yeah, in some, res in, in some situations, but right. certainly not all. But I think it is, it's just invaluable to be able to have that. To, uh, your therapists who are working with your organization, do they have any kind of special training? Um, they do. They're, first of all, they're all, um, they're all licensed in the state of Maryland. Um, we have both... Um, licensed oncology social workers, so they're dedicated to this field of study, or um, masters in social work, or psychologists. So it's kind of runs the gamut of those. And then what we require again, because this group therapy is very different than one-on-one -on -one therapy, 
So they go through a, a training program that includes sitting in on other groups, watching the way that the, the pre-trained facilitators are working with group. Um, we also do clinical supervision um, meetings once a month where the whole clinical team can come together and talk, just like they do in a, a group will talk. They talk about what's going on in their groups, especially if they need help sorting out how they could better help uh, one patient or mm -hmm. a participant. When you're dealing with the elderly, what, when do you talk about the hospice talk? When you're, when you're dealing with your older patient dealing with cancer who says, you know, I've had enough, um, I don't want to have any other treatments, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Do you discuss hospice? Because now we're not in palliative. Well, right, or I guess they still do palliative. They do care. actually. Luckily, the hospice world has changed a lot. It used to be that you can't get any treatment when you go into hospice. That's not the case anymore. Um, but we put the hospice um, information in our education bucket. So we'll bring in somebody from one of the hospice organizations to do a educational workshop on what is hospice all about. How can we help? How can we serve you? So it's not only the critically ill who go to that, but also people who know that might be something they're going to face down the line. Mm -hmm. um, what we really do is we don't introduce hospice to people. I mean, we introduce the concept to people. It's usually their medical team who says it's time for hospice. Mm -hmm. um, we have more, a lot of end-of-life conversations with our advanced cancer group because those are people who know that their time is limited that their disease has metastasized, that there is perhaps no other treatment. Um, they are not going to be cured. Eventually, they're going to die from this disease. So we talk to them about what is it you want to leave behind. You know, we talk about legacies. We talk about what is it you want, you know, how do, how do you want your family and friends to remember you? You know, and some of that plays into the treatment options. You know, I don't want to rem have them remember me bald and in bed and unable to, like, to take care of myself. Mm -hmm. I'd rather have them remember me as, you know, an individual, not as cancer. Mm -hmm. What are some of the other things that you hear? Tell, tell us about some, some stories of people you've worked with. It's, it's really interesting because just like cancer itself, every person is very different in how they deal with end of life, how they deal with you know, their mortality um, is different. We have, there was one woman who, um, she practically lived at our place. I mean, she was just amazing. And, and I might say, I have yeah. been there, well, not to your new place, but yeah. your old place was gorgeous. And now you were telling me earlier about how gorgeous the new place is. That just, and I want you to go back to what you were saying, but I just want people to know what a serene and comforting place it, you, you get this sense when you walk through your doors. that this Thank is you so much for saying that because it is important that we are, we're in a home, we're not in a clinic, we're not in a doctor's office, there's no shoveling you out because the room is booked for the next thing. It's really a home where people think of it as their second home and that becomes really critical. So this one woman I was telling you about is that really she felt um, she had no family here. So her support group became her family. And they really were, you know, really embraced her and embraced her um, statement that she no longer wanted any kind of treatment. And several of them were actually, she died at home, or, and were there with her when she died at home. And she said, and they, that I wasn't there, but several people relayed it, that she looked at her ceiling and she said, my ceiling is all crackling. And, of course, they're looking up, and it's not. And she said, it's opening up. Oh, she wow. She said, you're helping me be welcomed home. And it was just, I mean, oh. I get goosebumps every yeah. time I think of it. It was just so moving. Um, there was another instance, and this is not an end-of-life um, instance, although, I mean, it may be. But this couple um, were having, I mean, they were like this. And they were an older couple. They've been together for so many years, I think 45 or 50 years. Mm -hmm. They are and out there. <laughs> they're out there. And the gentleman was in the caregiver group. And it was one day that just by happenstance, it wound up being just men. 
in the group that day, which is not, I don't think it's ever happened since, but sometimes things happen for a reason. Yes. Exactly. So, and one of the guy's wife was near death. And so the facilitator, I mean, they were talking about sort of superfluous things. And the facilitator said, just give me a second here. You know that your wife is dying. I know how painful this is. I'd like you to talk about this. Well, the guy who was, had been at loggerheads with his wife said, you can't do that. You can't make him do that. And she said, trust me on this. So the man started talking about his wife and started crying. The other man started crying. The whole, there was this catharsis that happened mm. that was amazing. So the next day, the woman comes in and she goes up to the facilitator and who was going to be facilitating her group that day as a sub. And again, why did that happen? And she went up to him and she said, what did you do to my husband? And of course, it was like, uh, well, what do you mean? And she told, she said, my husband came home from group yesterday and he had all these errands he was going to run. And he said, I, I'm not going to do this. We need to sit down and talk. He said, I know now, I have learned that I can't fix this thing. I know that I have been pushing you away because I've been so scared about losing you. Mm. He wow. said, then she said, and we cried oh. and we talked for hours. She goes, you've made me fall in love with my husband again. Oh, my gosh. I mean, please. Yeah. Please. So. Wow. Yeah. Makes me almost cry every yeah. time I do that. <laughs> me too. <laughs> so, so it's a very, um, it's a really impactful experience. To say um, the least. And, you know, and I encourage people to take that first step to walk through the doors. That's the hardest step. Mm -hmm. To know that you will be embraced. Our support groups end with hugs. We hug a lot. That's, that's <laughs> a do. good thing. But we have some very exciting news, too. Tell us. One of the things that we realize is living in the Washington, D.C. area, geography matters. It's hard. You to mean because of traffic? <laughs> because of traffic. So our long-term goal has always been to be able to provide our services throughout the region. Um, because no one does the work we do except for Life with Cancer, which is in Fairfax County. No one else does it. So it's our goal to spread out. Well, there's a new cancer center that um, opened in Rockville on the grounds of Shady Grove Adventist Hospital called the Aquilino Cancer Center. Just opened on October 1st. And they are contracting with us to bring our programs into the center. Wow, fantastic. So people who are up county now don't that have would to be come neat. so far. That's wonderful. So we're very excited about yes, it. Yes, great news. And to be able to serve more people with the wonderful services you provide. Can't ask for more than that. That's right. Well, I found this very helpful, and it's great to know that there are so many wonderful programs that you offer and the support that you give. And again, my brief experience working with some of the people who I met with after I gave my presentation at your lovely uh, location um, were just very special people. Well, so. thank you. And I would definitely like to leave people with just the reminder that everything is free. Okay. We will and not charge anyone a penny to come and take part in any of our programs. Great to know. And we didn't really have time, unfortunately, to get into that you're you need donations to help yes, fund do. you. But if somebody does want to get in touch with you, Paula, how can they do that? Two ways. They can call us at 301-634-7500 or go on our website, which is hopeconnectionsforcancer.org. Wonderful. Well, thank you again for being here. Thank you. And if you have any ideas for a topic you'd like to see on Senior Solutions, please feel free to email me at senior solutions tv at gmail.com. Otherwise, we'll see you next time. <music>